You know, I started working on this book almost 20 years ago. It was actually 1994. I was editor of New Media at Time, Inc., and we were moving uh, our content away from things like AOL and CompuServe directly onto the Internet, which had just opened up. Uh, the World Wide Web and the browsers had just been developed. And I got called in by the president of Time Warner, CEO of Time Warner. He said, what are you doing? I said, I explained it. And he said, well, who owns the Internet? And I thought, that's a really clueless question. So I said, nobody owns the Internet. I said, well, who built it? And I thought, that's really clueless. And then I thought, I don't know the answer. <laughs> and I thought it would be really interesting for those of us who love the digital revolution to actually have a sense of how it came about. Uh, so I started gathering string. One of the nice things about being at Time Magazine is that you can actually meet people, or you just offer to put them on the cover and they'll meet you. So whether it was Andy Grove or Gordon Moore or Mark Andreessen or uh, Tim Berners-Lee and the other people who had developed the internet and the personal computer, I got to interview them and I started gathering string. Uh, I was doing that uh, when Steve Jobs asked me to uh, do his biography, so I put it aside. But both by working with Steve Jobs and also when I interviewed Bill Gates, he said, it's not just the Internet. The reason that we have a digital revolution is a combination of things. It's a personal computer combined with the Internet. It's just like the Industrial Revolution, where you combine the steam engine with mechanical processes. And I realized that this was a revolution that we didn't really, hadn't really been written up. You know, we've written about the scientific revolution, uh, the industrial revolution, the American revolution. And we know all the characters and the teamwork of a George Washington and Ben Franklin for the American revolution. But even some of you right here in the cradle of where most of it was born, probably would have trouble figuring out exactly who were the people who did the first big computers, how did the personal computer come about, microchips, that sort of thing. So I wanted to show that, and I wanted to show it through innovation. Now innovation, as Gary Lauder will tell you since uh, he's in the forefront of this, is an overused buzzword, and it's almost been drained of its meaning because it's been used so much. So I wanted to do a book that actually looked at the 12 or so major innovations that got us to where we were and figure out who actually did them, how did they do it, what talents did they have. And one of the things that struck me, which Bob alluded to just a moment ago, is that these are not singular individuals sitting in a garage or a garret having a light bulb moment and coming up with an innovation. These are people who created teams, that collaboration was integral to innovation in the digital age, and creativity was a team sport. Even with Steve Jobs, who was a very visionary leader, uh, those of us who write biographies know in the back of our minds that we distort history a little bit. We make it sound like this innovative guy just went to his garage and Apple computer came about. What I realized about Steve, that even though he was hard to work with and prickly at times, he was unbelievable at creating a team around him, a dedicated, loyal team who could execute on his vision. And that was rule one of the digital age, which is that vision without execution is just hallucination. <laughs> and um, you see it all the time, including if you look at the romantic historians writing about the birth of the computer, They'll talk about John Vincent Adanasoff, this loner in Iowa State who in the basement of the physics building creates a circuit. And the circuit could do logical processing and other things. And people say, well, that's the original computer and he's been written out of history and he was a lone inventor. And you say, no, he never got it to work. He never got the punch card readers. He never put together the team of collaborators that made it a real machine. It was people at Bletchley Park, England, breaking the German Enigma code, working with Alan Turing, and people at the University of Pennsylvania, building ENIAC with John Mockley. They were the ones who built teams and collaborated so they had computers that actually worked. In fact, John Mockley, who was the visionary of the ENIAC machine, he travels all over. He is typical of a real innovator. And uh, I don't mean to keep singling Gary out, but he and I often talk about intellectual property issues. 
And, you know, John Markley was one of those people who was a nightmare for intellectual property lawyers because he would travel around the country going to Vassar in the 1939 World's Fair and even to John Adonassoff in Iowa State and say, well, that, you know, and he'd visit them and he'd pick up ideas because his father was one of these collaborative scientists with the Carnegie Institute in Washington. He loved bringing people together. And so you have this guy who loved traveling all over the country picking up ideas, and then he brings them to Penn and puts them together and makes ENIAC. He does it by having a great engineer named Presper Eckert, but he also hires six, we well, hires a lot of women mathematicians to do the calculations for it and pick six of them to actually be able to program it. Back then, the uh, men thought that the hardware engineering, you know, boys with their toys, was the important thing and that programming it, plugging the cables in and out, was somewhat of a menial task, so they left it to the women. What they didn't know and got surprised by was that the programming actually was the more important part. The machines became commoditized, but this notion of programming uh, that the women of ENIAC did was so crucial. But to me, the main thing about that was build a team, collaborate, because creativity is a collaborative sport in the digital age. The other thing is that disruption, and innovative disruption, is nothing new. You know, I went back and started reading about the Industrial Revolution. And that's where you had truly disruptive innovation, where the steam engine was being combined with mechanical looms that were, you know, building um, these big weaving machines, great tapestries, great work, Jacquard's loom it was called, and putting the weavers out of work. Lord Byron, whose daughter is the beginning chapter and ending chapter of this book, Ada Byron Lovelace. Lord Byron was a Luddite, and I mean that literally. The only speech he gave in the House of Lords was supporting the followers of Ned Ludd, the person who was leading the people who were smashing the looms in the Midlands of England because they were putting uh, weavers out of work. And so Ned Ludd and his followers would go around and smash these looms. There was a law that was being proposed in the House of Lords, and Byron fights it because he said, these machines are bad. They're taking work away. His daughter felt differently. His daughter, Ada Byron Lovelace, is one of the most wonderful characters. I think Craig Newmark, was it Craig? Are you here? Yeah, Craig Newmark gave me a Ada Lovelace badge just a few moments ago uh, because uh, he saw that I opened with Ada Lovelace. Ada was Lord Byron's daughter. If you know anything about Lord Byron, you will understand fully that Lady Byron was not particularly fond of Lord Byron <laughs> by the time Ada was growing up. And so Lady Byron had Ada tutored only in mathematics, as if that were an antidote to being a romantic poet. She ended up loving both poetry and math, poetry and science, and she developed an affection for what she called poetical science. So when she tours the Midlands after hearing of her father's speech against these looms, she looks at the punch cards that are making these tapestries. And she has a friend named Charles Babbage who has created, not really built, but trying to build something called the analytical engine, which is a calculator, a numerical calculator, big old machine calculator, and it used punch cards in order to instruct it what numbers it would process. And Ada's great insight from having looked at these looms and from connecting art to science, the humanities to technology, was that if you use punch cards like that, you could make the machine do anything, not just numbers, but anything, she, uh, the way she put it, that could be notated symbolically. And then she explained what she meant. Music, words, <laughs> tapestries, art. The machine could do everything once you used the punch cards. And that's the basis of the general purpose computer we have today. 1830, she writes the notes on Babbage's analytical engine and does that. And that comes up with this idea, which I think is another lesson of the digital age and innovation, of connect art to technology. When I first started working with Steve Jobs, he said, you know, I was a humanities kid when I was growing up, but I kind of loved electronics as well. 
And then I read something that Edwin Land, the inventor of Polaroid, said, which is if you stand at that intersection of the arts and technology, that's where the creative uh, value added will occur. And many of you have probably been to, I know there are five people from Apple here tonight, I've already met, maybe even more, have been to the product launches that Steve Jobs did or seen them on YouTube. And at the end, he would always have a slide on the screen behind him, which was just a street sign that said the liberal arts and technology or sciences. He said, that's the intersection where we stand. That's the place that makes our hearts sing. That is another legacy of Ada Lovelace. But Ada had a third concept that's uh, a difficult and subtle one. I tried to write about it in the Wall Street Journal last week. She said, machines will be able to do everything. They'll be able to do music and words and pictures and, you know, tapestry and notes and whatever it may be, but they'll never be able to think. They'll never be creative. They'll never originate creative thought. The humans will have to originate the creative thought. A hundred years to the day almost after that, Alan Turing is um, at Bletchley Park, breaking the German Enigma codes, builds the machines that do it, and writes a wonderful paper called The Imitation Game. There's a movie coming out in about four weeks called The Imitation Game. Uh, I think I get to meet Kira Knightley because they love my Wall Street <laughs> Journal piece. And they, asked, they called up and they said, would you do a, uh, a panel with Kira? I said, yeah, um, <laughs> I will. And somebody named Benedict Cumberbatch, which some of you may know, but I, apparently he has a big Twitter following because uh, most of the tweets about my book involve Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays Alan Turing in the movie. But anyway, Alan Turing referred this, to this as Lady Lovelace's objection, that machines would never be able to think, that they wouldn't have creativity. And he came up with the imitation game to say, how would we know that? How would we believe that that's true? And um, the imitation game, now known as the Turing test, is that you just put a machine and a person in a different room and you send questions in. And after a while, if you can't tell the difference between the machine and the person, then it makes no sense to say the machine's not thinking. Now, there's a lot of philosophers, including uh, a great one, uh, J.R. Searle here at Berkeley, who say, well, that's a ridiculous test. But Turing said, you know, it's meaningless to say a machine's not thinking if you can't tell it apart from a human, just empirical. Uh, and he said in 20, 30, 40 years, there'll be machines that pass the Turing test. Well, you know what? It's been about 70 years, and the only machines that sort of maybe kind of fake it and pass the Turing test are ones that do sort of gimmicky reposts and pretend to be, you know, kids. There's no machine that actually seems to be thinking. And the quest for artificial intelligence, despite what you hear, especially in this area, about the singularity being near when machines will think without us and they won't need us anymore. What has turned out to be true is that Ada Lovelace's vision of combining humans with machines, of that combination of human imagination and creativity and machine processing power will always grow faster, she said, than either machines alone or humans alone. And you can look even at uh, Watson, you know, who could play Jeopardy. But now IBM is using Watson to collaborate with doctors and all to figure out cancer diagnosis. And they figure out that the combination of the machine and doctors is like exponentially better. Likewise, Kasparov, who gets beaten by Deep Blue, another IBM machine, creates a tournament in which he says a human and machine will play together against anybody. Another human machine, but also the greatest grandmasters, the greatest machines. And in every one of his tournaments, the human-machine combination, even amateur chess players with laptop machines can beat the machine-only uh, chess playing game or the grandmaster-only chess playing game. So that is another theme of the digital age, is the collaboration, the personal connection that comes between us and our machines has been the great trajectory of the unknown people in the digital age. I look back uh, at the people I wish I had heard of, and besides the ones I've told you about, there's a theme that begins with Vannevar Bush, which is picking up on what is called Lady Lovelace's objection, and following this pattern of more tightly connecting humans to machines. 
Beneva Bush writes an essay in 1945. He's the one who helped oversee uh, the wartime efforts in the United States, helped oversee ENIAC and eventually the uh, building of networks. And it's called As We May Think, and it's about how you connect a person to a personal computer that will be the amplifier, both for the cube computer processing power and the human imagination. And then you move on to a guy who I really think somebody should do a great book on, J.C.R. Licklider, Lick Licklider, an uh, aw shucks Missouri guy. You don't hear much about him because he liked giving away credit more than taking credit. He was a great person at collaborating. He helped. He was at MIT, a, a psychology professor who also was an engineer at MIT, computer engineer. And so he helps build the uh, network for an air defense system in the 1950s at MIT, Lincoln Labs, BBN, Cambridge, sort of this combination that Vannevar Bush had put together of corporations, universities, and the government working as a triangle to do things. They were doing an air defense system, and he realized you have to have really easy to read graphic computer displays so that a console jockey sitting there will know, okay, that's a missile coming in, I've got to do something, because if it's hard to read or, and it's got to be interactive. It's got to be fast. And there are 23 of them around the country, so they have to be all networked so that they share information instantly. So he comes up with the notion of the Intergalactic Computer Network. He was a funny guy. He decided that was a fun title for it. When he gets to the Pentagon, he decides to fund it. It becomes known as ARPANET. We now call it the Internet. This is a guy who really understood that that connection, bringing people, computers, machines together, was the way we were going to progress. You see it through Doug Engelbart, then through Alan Kay and others at Xerox Park. Make our machines connect to us better. And then, of course, Steve Jobs visits Xerox Park and says, from now on, we're going to make it personal. A thousand songs in your pocket, iPhones, easy to use, graphical displays. And all the way through the computer age, as everybody predicts, starting in 1950, that 20 years from now we'll have artificial intelligence, there'll be a singularity, machines won't need us. It never seems to get closer than 20 years from now, but that notion of connecting the machine gets more and more personal, more and more intimate. And you even see it, uh, that's what Google is. Google is not like the other algorithms that try to search things on the web. Google combines the uh, processing power of a great algorithm searching the web, a spider searching the web, with human judgments, billions of human judgments made each week when people put links on their own web pages. So what uh, Google does is it combines those human judgments of the links that real humans are putting on their web page with computer processing power, and that's why it's got the most powerful search engine. And the most recent advances are things that make our computers more intimate and more closely connected to us. Google Watch, I mean, uh, Apple Watch, Google Glass, uh, those type of things. So that, to me, was an interesting trajectory of the digital age. And it gets back to the fact that, too, almost all the great advances of the digital age were collaborative. It was a collaborative process. Like the making of the computer ENIAC, it's the people who collaborated who did it best. And you uh, see that in the great teams that people created especially when they were not hierarchical, when people like Gordon Moore and Andy Grove break away and, and create Fairchild that then becomes Intel. It's like, let's reject the East Coast hierarchical structure with a top-down uh, command and control system, and let's distribute and work together as colleagues as a team. And that's where you get the microprocessor, but it's also how you get the internet. This Friday, I'm doing an event, which I think we'll put on YouTube, especially since Google owns YouTube, that Google's doing with us in Washington, in which um, they were just doing an event with me in Washington, and then Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn decided they wanted to come. Now, uh, and Vint sort of works for Google. Some. Vint and Bob are the two little-known people who actually did, with all due respect to Al Gore, invent the internet. They were the ones who wrote TCP IP protocols that are the transmission and internet protocols. And uh, they did it first with the ARPANET and then the internet in this unbelievably collaborative way. They were all sort of graduate students out here on the West Coast. They kept waiting for the authorities from back east to tell them how to do things. But in the meantime, 
they had these uh, new nodes, routers. They were, they were not called routers. They are called AMPs, Interface Met Messaging Processors. Fortunately, we changed the name to routers. But they had to figure out how are these routers going to speak to each other, the host computers, and nobody back east told them how. So they decided to do it collaboratively. And in order not to have a top-down hierarchical structure, but to make it feel more like a team, Nobody proposes anything or says, here's, here's the proposal, here's what we're going to do. They just write up ideas and they call them RFCs, meaning requests for comments. And there was a guy named Steve Crocker who came up with it. He said, that's the least intimidating name I can think of. If we just call every proposal we make a request for comment, everybody will feel like they're part of the team and inventing it. So in an open source way that you see in so many things, from the building of the internet to Linux to Wikipedia, People collaborate and share on a peer-to-peer -peer way. Another interesting thing that struck me, and this ties to the Aspen Institute a little bit, is that despite the promise of the digital age that we could collaborate at a distance and all telecommute and all sort of become friends with people in different places by just friending them on virtual networks and forming virtual communities, in the end, People like getting together physically. Even the people around the country who are the graduate students who are doing the request for comments, they started saying, hey, let's meet. They started meeting in Salt Lake City. They ended up in my hometown of New Orleans. I think that shows a particular progress um, <laughs> in terms of fun places to meet. Uh, but they got together every six months just so they could share things. And all the way through the digital age, including with the Aspen Institute, including events like tonight, we see that even though you could watch, you know, Aspen X lectures and watch this one indeed online and go to TED or TEDx or whatever it may be, people actually like hanging out, drinking a little bit of wine, talking, being in the flesh. And uh, in the end, when Steve Jobs was creating Pixar and then the new headquarters for Apple, it was like, he obsessed on things like making sure that you had to walk through the atrium in order to get to the bathrooms so people would have serendipitous physical meetings and not just communicate by email. Likewise, if you've been to Google, all the beanbag chairs and the open space, whatever. And in the end, we thought we were going to meet in internet chat rooms, but Googleplex beats Google Hangouts. You like being there physically. Marissa Mayer got in a little bit of trouble when she told people at Yahoo, quit telecommuting. But she said correctly, creativity and collaboration happen best in person. So that was another theme of the digital age, that even as we have these wonderful you know, ways of forming social networks and virtual friends, uh, that hunger for getting together in places uh, continues to exist. And it is the serendipity of great places where different types of people rub up against each other and have ideas that sparks innovation. The best of them was early on, Bell Labs. When Bell Labs moved after the war out to New Jersey, they did, just like Steve Jobs did, build a campus that was not a whole lot of separate buildings, but big, long corridors where uh, Shannon, uh, you know, John Dewey, who was a great information processing theorist, would ride a unicycle up and down the corridor juggling balls. And people like William Shockley, kind of crazed, but uh, and certainly became crazier. But William Shockley was a great quantum theorist who understood the movement of atoms in the surface states of semiconductors. But he worked with John Bardeen, who was just a plain old materials physicist, and a guy named Walter Bratton, who was just an experimentalist, knew how to dope a piece of silicon so it became more of a conductor, stick a uh, paper clip he used at one point to break through the surface states. And they sit around in the same workspace, on the same benches, as if they're a librettist and a composer doing a call and response duet, as they try to figure out how to make a piece of silicon become the right type of semiconductor and thus invent the transistor. And that's something else I wanted to do in this book. You know, when I was a geeky kid, um, you could open up your electronic devices. Don't try that at home now with your iPad. Steve doesn't allow you to open your devices. 
But I used to, you know, I was one of these kids who built, built Heath kits and ham radios. I loved to solder. You know, we, my dad was an electrical engineer. My uncles were. My brother is. And, um, you yeah, know, we would sort out the transistors, the capacitors, the resistors, figure them all out, test them. And even I'm old enough to remember when we used to have to test the tubes in the radio to figure out which one had burned out and go down the store and buy a tube. So, as Tim Berners-Lee said to me, it was really great to be able to actually know what an on-off switch did in the circuit, how you would make something work logically, what a transistor actually did. So, as I've always tried to do in my books, even with the Einstein book, I want to make this feel personal. I think everybody should actually understand how does a transistor work? How does it make electrons move one way and not the other way? How does it become a switch? How do you take what's called Boolean algebra, but don't worry, you don't have to understand it, but just yes, no answers, and make a tree that does something logical that gets you to a solution to a problem, and that's all a circuit is. And I think the fact that we're intimidated by our technology, we don't open up the backs of machines, we don't quite know what a circuit is, we don't know how an on-off switch is, you know, transistors or microchips work. We don't know how you sort of engrave lots of transistors on a microchip. It makes it feel that this is magic. And it is, of course, magic. When I pick up my cell phone and text my daughter from here and she's sitting in New York and I don't know even how it gets here, it seems like magic. But so too is Shakespeare. So too is Lord Byron's poetry. And we like to understand she walks in beauty like the night or whatever wonderful line we like out of Lord Byron. I think we should understand, too, that our technology, our science, our math, our circuits are beautiful, too, and have a real feel for that. Otherwise, we get a little bit abstracted or detached from our technology, and that's not a particularly healthy thing. There are many other lessons that sort of came from this book. Uh, you know, one of them was an old Steve Jobs lesson of keep it simple. Whenever you have a device you're making, you know, Steve, when he did the iPod, everybody else had made MP3 players, but Steve is like, no, I want a thousand songs in your pocket. I want to get to any song I want in three clicks. And, you know, and they roll their eyes and they say, well, Steve, we need some screen that shows the album. And he said, no, just if you can't get it to me in three clicks, don't even show it to me. So finally, they have that beautiful device with the click wheel, and it's intuitive. You just know how to turn it and click and get to the song you want. And he looks at it and says, yeah, that's simple. As Einstein said, as all the great scientists said, nature loves simplicity. But then he looked at the top of it, and there's a little button on top, a big button on top. And he says, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Tony Fidel, who will be at our conference here tomorrow, was the head of the engineering team. He's a truly delightful guy. He's now in Aspen a lot. You'll see him when you come. He's head of the iPod engineering team. He said, you know, we paused for a while because he knew what it was, but I finally said, Steve, that's the on-off button. Steve says, what the fuck does it do? Excuse my language, but you have to channel Steve here. Finally, Fidel says, well, it turns it on and off. And he says, Steve says, well, why the fuck do we need it? And it dawns on Tony and everybody else on the team, you don't really need an on-off switch. If you quit using your iPod, it powers itself down. If you start using it, it powers it up. Keep it simple remove things like that. And so that simplicity was also one of the great things of the digital age. And keep it beautiful. Remember, you're trying to connect. I was you, yeah, you're from the D school. We were talking about, you know, the Stanford D school is so amazing. It knows that the connection of beauty and technology is the be all and end all of the digital age. And then finally is that notion that was Ada Lovelace's of make it personal. Don't put the machine in another room and say it's going to think without us. Connect it to us. Make it intimate. And every single step of the digital revolution has been to try to make things a little bit more personal. And so I'm very hopeful. I think that, you know, you can be pessimistic about the digital age and think it's going to do weird things to us. I go back. There's a wonderful dialogue if you ever do the... Um, Aspen Executive Seminar, the Aspen Seminar, uh, Plato, Socrates, in which uh, Socrates is railing about papyrus and writing, that it's a technology that's going to cause rhetoric to disappear, cause people not to remember things, be distracting. 
We always blame our technologies, but our technologies are actually only as good or as bad as we are. So I wouldn't blame the technology except for to say that every advance in technology, especially one that has become more personal, becomes more empowering. That's what the internet did. It gave every single person on this planet an equal opportunity, not necessarily always able to grab that opportunity, but in theory you could, to write anything, publish anything, make any song, distribute it to anywhere, and get any idea, any song, any blog, from anywhere on a planet. And that, to me, is the ultimate empowering notion. It's why our technology, and why I really do consider this a digital revolution, up there with the Industrial Revolution or the Scientific Revolution, because it really transforms who we are. And to stick with Aristotle for just a moment, he did say, most famously of all, that man is a social animal. And every single time we've invented a technology, even if it wasn't intended for that, the street finds its own uses for things, and we've grabbed it to make it a social technology, to connect us as humans. And so the promise of the digital age is not that our technology will be divisive or that it will open a divide between rich and poor, whatever, but that if we use it right, it does connect us. It does empower us. It does make us more of a community. So I want to thank you all very much and hope to answer any questions you may have. And I'll also sign books once you finish answering questions. Anybody wants uh, Christmas gifts or whatever, uh, speak up. I can hardly, yes. Hey. Uh, as you see, uh, you know, the next billion people getting onto the internet um, that are experiencing the internet through their cell phones for the first time as opposed to like a laptop computer or uh, yeah. an iPad or something like that. Um, how do you see that kind of affecting where it's going to go? And, uh, and, 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 the, and, the way, and the way that the technology will shift uh, to uh, affect those needs? Well, obviously, mobile technology makes things even more personal. It also more individually empowering. I mean, it used to be that computers were big old things that you shared. You know, you couldn't you really have the hands-on imperative. The ultimate hands-on imperative is when the computer is your mobile phone or your wristwatch or your eyeglass or whatever. I think the way that it goes, though, is that computing power becomes so ubiquitous that we hardly notice that we're interacting with it. We'll be able to have voice recognition, so unlike Siri today, but Siri tomorrow at least, it'll be like the movie where you can just talk to your phone and say, here's what I want. And we won't notice that we're, quote, using computing power or that we're on a computer or that something we will just have it totally integrated into our lives, which is, of course, the opposite of the singularity artificial intelligence folks who think that the computers will sort of be on their own superseding us. Um, I do think that as computing gets totally integrated into our lives, it, technology has never outraced our moral ability to get our heads around technology privacy issues, NSA issues, whatever. I think we have to be a little bit careful because this is going real fast. Um, I also think that the next phase, I hope, will be more collaborative because I do think that that's a yearning that humans have and it's written into the DNA of the digital age because of the collaborative way the internet was designed, computers were built. So I would love it where we have our devices and we're writing plays or books or whatever, and everybody's collaborating on them, maybe with one curator. But you know, if you're somebody who's particularly interested in I'm writing this book, but you're interested in how um, you know, Linux came about or how uh, Dan Bricklin did uh, VisiCalc or how you know, Google came about. They'll say, hey, I was employee number seven on Google. Here's some of our original things. And everybody gets to upload it into sort of a collaborative history. So I'm looking for that sort of thing. And finally, I think the next, this is not dealing with mobile, but mobile ties into it tightly. 
We are on the cusp, and every time I say this, people come up to me and say, hey, I have this idea and it's about to work, but we're on the cusp of really having it work, of having absolutely easy Bitcoin-like digital payments that don't demand the clunkiness of a PayPal and all these words. We can just walk around and you collaborate and people read your book together, and then the royalties are allocated based on what people were reading, and it gives you something that the Statute of Anne did 450 years ago in England, which is some intellectual property rights for every time somebody copied something you made and you got a little bit of money for it, so that produces a burst of creativity. If we had easy digital currencies and payment systems, so that people contributed to magazines, music, songs, wrote songs together, whatever it may be, all could divvy up the revenues from it instead of having it be ad-driven, which I find odious and um, ethically challenging to say, I am producing, you know, I won't name newspapers, but producing a site mainly to be clickbait to aggregate eyeballs for advertisers. That's not how you're gonna get the most creativity. But if you have some easy payment system with mobile and social and an easy payment system, we'll have a whole new creative economy that will be even greater than the creative economy leap that happened when Steve Jobs finally allowed apps from third-party developers to be put on iOS. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. Okay, I'll get to you next. Sorry. Yeah, no, you go ahead. You know. Outside understanding the power of collaboration. Did you discover anything in the research in this book that was a common thread amongst all these innovators? Anything that stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that has stood out in all the books I've written is that you have to have somewhat of a rebellious streak. Think out of the box. Think different, as Steve, if not his English teacher, would say. Um, and all of these people willing to challenge authority, people ask, why does it all happen here in Silicon Valley, for example, the digital revolution? Uh, why does it happen in America, people ask. Well, partly it's because we tolerate failure more, especially here. People who are venture capitalists in this community know if you fail three times, that doesn't disqualify you from, you know, making your next pitch. Um, there was, in the 1970s, I have a whole chapter about this. I mean, I got totally obsessed by it. In fact, I collaborated on this chapter by putting it online and having different people edit it, including Stuart Brand, who starts editing it. Most of you know Stuart Brand did the Whole Earth Catalog, The Well. He lives, I think, on a houseboat in Marin, which I guess is there. I don't know. Um, there, sorry. Um, and so that counterculture that's coming up with the free speech movement coming out of Berkeley, the hippie movement, the electric Kool-Aid acid tests of, you know, Ken Kesey and others, as well as the electronic geek culture and the hobbyist culture, these are people that were dedicated, including community organizers, to making sure that computers were not the way Orwell told us they would be, meaning uh, tools of control by the power establishment, that they would become power to the people. And so they create personal computers. They fail a whole lot. They create the Homebrew Computer Club and... You know, the Altair is shown off and a couple other really junky computers and this kid Wozniak says, hey, I can make one and put a keyboard next to it and he's kind of free-spirited so it gives it away to everybody at the um, Homebrew Computer Club and his friend from down the street, Steve Jobs, says, wait a minute, we can make these in my parents' garage and sell them so don't give them away and that's how Apple is founded and so there's that tension between sort of the sharing communal economy here and the entrepreneurial economy. So those wonderful tensions that happen here in the Bay Area and happen in America in general, I think create the yeasty ferment of, in a cauldron that allows personal computers to pop up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, hey, Anne. Uh, hang on, sorry. Just answer that. Yeah. So my add-on question is, um, with sort of the, the yeasty fermentation of oh. these ideas that we're seeing in America, what, 
what impact is the decreasing in governmental funding from, say, NASA, NSF, et cetera, yeah. going to cause on the entrepreneurial and innovation culture? We, it's going see? to be devastating. I say in my book that this Veneva Bush wrote two essays in 1945. Relatively unknown guy, but shouldn't be unknown. One was, um, as we may think, which envisions the person computer, and one is, the other is science, the new frontier, the next frontier, very American title. And having done this during the war, he proposes that there should be an equal partnership between universities, corporations, and the government to do basic research. And he calls it the seed corn for which future inventions will be grown. And for a long period of time, you have basically equal contributions to basic research whether it's you know, Bell Labs and Xerox Park on the corporate side and Stanford and MIT and Harvard and Penn and the government, and especially in the Eisenhower years. Dwight Eisenhower is another hero of this book. The internet would not have happened with him, and NASA, of course, wouldn't have happened with him. But he calls them my scientists. He loves them. He brings them in. He loves when they were Bush and Kelly and all the others. And he creates NASA and he creates ARPA. He puts it in the Pentagon smartly, since, as you know, he had been, I think, a five-star general. And he realizes if it's in the Pentagon, it'll be more protected than the five. But he also creates the National Science Foundation. And there is an enormous amount of funding for basic research. And it is the great legacy of the Eisenhower years that that funding leads to the space program, leads to the transistor, leads to the microchip, leads to uh, the personal computer and, of course, mainly the internet. Um, I was stunned that in the past 20 years, basic research from government has just fallen off a cliff. I mean, just, it's astonishing. Now, you know, this is why we well, the sequencing the genome, which was the last great thing that government helped fund. You know, you say, okay, we sequence the genome. That's actually going to have some real payoffs. I mean, we're watching it happen now. But we're not doing the next one. Obama announced we were going to map the human brain, which is the next big one if you want to, you know, neural mapping of the brain. But with all due respect to President Obama, and maybe it's not his fault, maybe it's the way Washington works, that was an announcement. It meant nothing. It did not happen. You know, it was just a speech. So I deeply fear two things. One, that our destroying of the seed corn for future generations of basic research by not having government basic research, by the sequester just blew it away. Because if you have basic research, you need to have steady, you know, you can't just sort of say, hey, here's one year of funding. So whole, I mean, this is, I know this from Harvard, but I'm sure it's true at Stanford too, whole cohorts of young researchers who couldn't get grants over the past two years don't exist their products, their projects, doing Alzheimer's, whatever it would be. So that's devastating. And the other thing that I think eats our seed corn and that I worry about, and I know the Fishers have been very involved in this, is we used to have the best education system in the world, and thus we had the best innovation. You can argue whether we're number 17 or number 20 or number 21 in the world today, but whatever it is, we're going to be number 17, 20, or 21 when it comes to innovation in a generation if we don't fix, especially our K through 12 education system. Yes, ma'am and then sir. Yeah. She got her hand up a nanosecond before Sorry. you did. You feature so many great women in your book, and I'm wondering if you can comment on the representation of women in technology currently yeah, you know, just, and what we might yeah. do to be able to shift I don't that. know. Y'all should Google Nick Bilton's article that was in Thursday's paper that leads you know, with my book and the women in the book. It actually mentions my daughter, who some people here know. It was in Aspen uh, in 2007 when uh, she was a, entering her senior year in high school and she hadn't written her college admissions essay. And those of you who are parents could imagine what my wife was like. Like, Betsy, you've got to write this essay. And my wife was somebody who believed that you were supposed to help your child write the essay. And Betsy didn't believe we should even read it. So I was sitting back watching the tension happen in the household until Betsy came down and said, all right, I've done it. 
I said, it, and I said, well, what's it on? And she said, Ada Lovelace. So as you can tell, the book begins and ends with Ada Lovelace for that reason, because I said to her, you know, I kind of knew, I'd heard of Ada Lovelace. I said, what did she do? You know, what was that? You know, remind me what algorithm she did. And she said, yeah, she's one of the women who've been written out of history, because she came up with the concept of the general purpose computer and programming. And likewise, the six women of ENIAC, or Grace Hopper at Harvard, and others who did it. So I started looking at them and having whole chapters on <laughs> especially women programmers, because I believe one reason those of us who write history do so is because if you have role models and if you believe things happen, then it empowers you to say, I can do things. And that's something we don't have now. It is astonishing if you read Nick Bilton's piece. The precipitous decline in the number of women who are majoring in computer science. Far less than 20 years ago. I mean, it's going in the wrong direction. I think 0.4% of women entering college now are majoring in computer science. And the uh, absolute percentage of male versus female doing computer science has not gotten more equal, but far less equal. What also surprised me, because I loved Grace Hopper. She's one of the heroes of this book. Uh, I won't go into it too much, but I will say she was a PhD from Yale in math, became a professor at Vassar. And when Pearl Harbor happens, she decides her life is boring. And she divorces her husband, quits being a professor at Vassar, and joins the Navy. Uh, she thinks she's going to go fight in the war. She ends up being a rear admiral, but they end up having her program the computers, uh, the Mark I at Harvard. Um, so I was saying, okay, Grace Hopper, and the person, the only person who's ever written on Grace Hopper, an MIT professor, I won't say his name because I don't want to knock him because it's a great book, said the first woman to get a PhD from Yale. So I'll put that in. And I think, you know, that doesn't feel, a PhD in math from Yale. And I look, and she's like the 30th to get a PhD in math from Yale. And in the 1930s, more women got PhDs in math than in the 1950s or the 1960s. I mean, absolute total. And obviously, the percentage was even higher, meaning because more people were getting PhDs in the 50s and the 30s. But the number goes down because, and I don't know why. I mean, if you start saying why, you know, you end up like Larry Summers and being a former president or something. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, you know, whether it's sexism, whether it's not enough role models. I also think that, just as a society in general, we get a little bit too intimidated by math. What Ada Lovelace, and this is why I really, really hammer home Ada Lovelace, she understood that a mathematical equation was something you visualize, which is not the way we do math. Like. She understood that it was like Rosy Finger Dawn, you know, a line of poetry. And you could say, OK, I get it. I see what this equation does. So I think we have to, all of us, women and men, who are not mathematicians or scientists, be a little bit less intimidated by math and be a little bit more admiring of the beauty of math. There are people, and now I'm getting off the gender issue, but just generally, there are people I know who are, you know, social scientists, humanists, you know, and think they're educated people and they'd be appalled if somebody said, oh, I don't know Shakespeare, I don't like Shakespeare, and I don't know the difference between Hamlet and Macbeth, they'd think that person's a Philistine. And yet they would happily say, I don't know the difference between an integral and differential equation. I don't know the difference between a, they'd laugh, I don't know the difference between a transistor and a capacitor or a gene and a chromosome. And we shouldn't allow that to happen. I think it happens to women more than men, and I don't want to tread too far before I get in trouble, but women seem to get, when they go into college, and universities make it more so. Like, if you're going to major in English, there's no gating factor. But when my daughter wanted to major in computer science at Harvard, she had to take math 51A and 51B, and they were really tough. And it becomes an intimidating gating factor. And there's just a lot of reasons that we have to overcome this um, not having creative people feel comfortable or creative women feel comfortable in the math and the sciences. You touched on education some. What do you think the implications are, both good and bad, in K-12 education and higher education with this technology evolution piece? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, two years ago we thought that MOOCs were going to change everything and they were, you know, going to upend education. And last year you start reading stories that MOOCs were a thing of the past and, you know, have been forgotten. I think neither narrative is right. I think, uh, you know, I've become quite involved with Khan Academy. Sal has joined our board. The Aspen Institute does the American History and Civics courses in Khan Academy. Uh, I like the fact that Harvard and MIT under the edX banner are now going to do high school and AP courses. I think it could be used to democratize education or it could lead to a greater digital divide between those who have broadband and those who, you know, come from neighborhoods where they don't go home to a, you know, Wi-Fi broadband with lots of computers sitting around. Um, I tend to think of this is what we're doing at Aspen. Graham Vesey, who's not here, but he's around. I just left him a few minutes ago. And Kitty and others are working on it. Is the combination of place-based learning and online learning. I think that that fits into the narrative I said earlier that's in my book, which is we are doing a few courses at Aspen uh, in which you take the courses online. One is on privacy in the Constitution. And because we're the Aspen Institute, we get a lot of cool people like Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and you know Steve Breyer and various, um, uh, you know, Ted Olson, all to give lessons on privacy in the Constitution. They do it online, they're games to play. But if you complete the course, you get to come to Philadelphia. We're doing one with the Socrates program that Gary and Laura helped launch 50 years ago or 60 years ago, whenever that was. Uh, we're doing one in Philadelphia that's not just the Socrates program, but where you get to then meet Sandra Day O'Connor and spend a weekend actually in physical proximity discussions with them. I think universities and high schools that are doing that blended learning will probably be transformative. But it will not sort of, I had a dinner last night, it seems like forever because it was in New York, but with Michael Levitt who was in the cabinet of George W. Bush. And he was talking about Western Governors University and how there's no campus at all and you just, take the courses online, you get graded on competency online, you never see anything. And he says this is the greatest thing in the world, it's transforming education. And since he's been a governor and a cabinet secretary, I didn't push back and argue, but there was something in me that said, no, that notion of never having actually seen or been on a campus or interacted, that doesn't feel right to me, but you know, we're just feeling our way. We're in our first five or six years of this. What do you think? I mean, you're involved? Yeah. Um, it's hard to predict, but I can't predict it will stay the same as it is now because yeah. there's so much more ahead of us based on what we're going to face with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do think there's two things we have to do. We have to make sure we use the technology tools to create great learning. And I think really, you know, I shouldn't say really, but smart kids like my daughter and who come from a background in which there's Wi-Fi all over the place, you know, she grows up and she geeks out on Wikipedia and she plays all sorts of educational games and she knows how Ada Lovelace programmed Bernoulli numbers, not because she was taught it, but because she drilled down on it online. But after Hurricane Katrina, I started, you know, getting to know a lot of the kids who had had to you know, family problems after Katrina. And there's a digital divide that's happening, and we don't want that to happen either. Because if we have a digital revolution and it's not shared, there's not a shared prosperity from it, that could be really bad for our society. That's where the Industrial Revolution went astray for a while until it righted itself. Yeah, yeah, one more, sorry. many, many things over the, over the last 20, 25 years. Um, but at, at some point in time, don't you see something like access through libraries or other institutions that we have as being substitutes? They used to be a place where people could get books where they couldn't buy books. Uh, it's a place where they could do learning where they couldn't do learning in, if they weren't participating in an institution. 
So couldn't they be a substitute, if you will, for the digital divide, a place for people to go? Yeah. We have um, a library at the Aspen Institute. A Charlie Firestone's program runs the libraries of the Future Institute. And by the way, the great thing that J.C.R. Licklider <coughs> did when he first comes up with the things I talked about was doing a Carnegie report on libraries of the future. Um, I think, you know, after Katrina, we took the libraries of New Orleans and made them community learning centers. There was no need to just have it be repositories for books. I think that's good. I don't think, I don't think that's the total solution. I do think that mobile is more of a solution, meaning every kid, almost every kid, any socioeconomic group, will end up with some mobile device that has data on it. I don't think you can say there's some kids who have to go to the library from three to seven to use a computer, and there are other kids who are doing it at home. I think we should try to make computing more ubiquitous. And Bob, let me real quickly, if I may, just because his hand was up too. Yeah, go ahead, and I'll be real fast. No, I mean, you had mentioned it about the industrial revolution creating yeah. a divide. It was yeah. exploiting the worker class. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think that the digital revolution can bring a change to that worldwide. Yeah, I mean, and this is something that Bob, who, as you know, is Undersecretary of the Treasury and worked with great minds. Economists disagree. We had a debate at the Aspen Ideas Festival between Larry Summers and Penny Pritzker on the question, really, of whether or not technology this time around was going to create greater inequality and reduce the number of jobs. We always think that that's going to happen. The data points throughout history is no, it doesn't happen. You know, that the weavers may get put out of work, but actually employment goes up throughout the Industrial Revolution. New jobs are created. You know, Kitty and I came here in Uber. You know, Kitty touches a screen and an Uber car appears, a Toyota. That was not a job that when Bob was at Treasury and you were looking at the employment stats, you would say a sharing economy in which somebody will take an, a, a, an Uber to an Airbnb. And I'm not even sure how that counts into the gross, <laughs> you know. And, and so, so I don't think we're very good at knowing that. I do remain a techno-optimist, meaning every era of history, people said technology will end up putting a whole lot of people out of work. And, you know, that's what all science fiction seems to be about. It just doesn't happen. But it's because we're careful about how we use our technology and we care about saying, let's be inclusive. Let's make a society in which prosperity is there for all. That doesn't happen naturally. That's a moral instinct of humans. And if we lose that moral instinct, our technology is not going to fix it for us. In fact, our technology will just amplify our problems. So as we go into this next stage, you just always have to look around and say it's not about exclusivity. It's not about, you know, it's about what can we do to make this more inclusive, this prosperity. 